Now at the beginning of the course, I told you that it was important for our models to be simple in order to generalize from training to test. And I didn't really say that precisely before, but I will in this lecture on statistical learning theory. And it really boils down to the notion that generalization is data plus knowledge, right? Finite data can only go so far in producing a good model. It cannot replace knowledge, right? Knowledge is what allows you to figure out how to restrict to a simpler function class. And so you can model your data well, but keep, keep it simple, right? And, um, and that's what enables you to generalize. Now, there's no universal single way to measure simplicity or complexity of a class of functions, but we're going to give at least one precise way to measure this, which is the VC dimension. And um, the VC dimension is a beautiful combinatorial quantity, and it, you know, it was part of the reason I was inspired to go into machine learning. And we're going to show how our ability to learn depends on the simplicity of the class of models through VC dimension and through other uh, ways. So we're going to make concrete via proof uh, that uh, this, you know, this philosophical argument that somehow learning needs simplicity. Okay, so let's uh, go over some notation. And as you know, uh, we have these uh, pairs of points, no surprise. They're drawn independent and identically distributed from a joint distribution on the set X cross Y. Okay, so uh, this IID assumption, you may say it's relatively strong, but that is the assumption that all statistical learning theory uh, at least a lot of what I know of it is based on. Okay, the x's are drawn from a set x, the y's are either negative one or one. So if you want to think about this joint distribution uh, d, you can think about it as being something that looks like this. So where x can be whatever it wants to in the space x, and then y is either plus one or minus one. And there's some density, uh, you know, on either, you know, around for each x, there's some density on on plus one and minus one for y. Okay, so I've, maybe I've shaded the areas of higher density in white, for instance. Okay, and maybe for each x, there's some probability that y is plus one and some probability that y is minus one. And our goal is to produce a function that goes from x to y that predicts y from x. Not a surprise. And the way we're gonna measure the quality of f is using the true risk. And the true risk is the probability that f of x does not equal y. And we want that true risk to be as low as possible. Again, we can't compute the true risk because the true risk requires us to know the entire distribution that the data are drawn from. And in reality, we would never have that. Okay, so another way to write this probability is the expectation of the indicator function that f of x does not equal y. And you might say, well, how did we get from this probability to this, indicate, to this expectation of this indicator function? And it turns out that indicator functions, they just do this. You, you, can, you can actually do this for any indicator function. You can go between a probability and, um, and an indicator function. So, um, so let me show you how that works. So I'm gonna just write down uh, the definition of that expectation there, the expectation of an indicator function. Now, um, indicator functions have only two outcomes. It's either one or zero, because it's an indicator function. So either the thing happens or it doesn't. So I'm giving you an example here. It's an indicator for when a random variable called z is equal to a quantity called blah. And um, that indicator is either one is equals blah or zero if it's not. Okay, so I write down the definition of expectation, which is the outcome one times the probability of getting that outcome, which happens when z equals blah, plus zero times something, who cares, zero, all right. Cool. Now, um, if you simplify that a little bit, you see immediately that it's the probability that z equals blah. So if I do that with an example, um, here's my random variable z, which equals could equal a number of different outcomes, interesting outcomes. And um, sometimes z is blah, and sometimes it's not. So if I write out this, if I write out this uh, this quantity here for the expectation, I get the outcome one times the probability that z equals blah, which is four out of the seven times, and then um, plus zero times that probability, okay, it's zero. And then, of course, that's the same thing as the probability that z equals blah, which is just four out of seven. Okay, cool. So hopefully it makes it clear that these, these two things are the same because the expectation is of an indicator variable. Now I wanted to find the regression function eta it is the expectation of y for each x. 
Okay, so um, since y can be either positive or negative, eta can also be positive or negative. So if you want to draw eta on this plot, maybe it looks something like that. I don't know how precise I was about that, but I thought it looked kind of like the expectation of y for each x. I don't know. In any case, um, in order to construct eta, you have to know the whole distribution of y for each x. And you can think of eta as being constructed pointwise. Like think about taking any value of x you want and looking at the distribution of y's on that x. And that distribution of y's tells you what eta is at that particular point x, okay? So in order to construct eta, you have to know the whole distribution that the data are drawn from, and you, can, you have to be allowed to choose any eta you want. You can't restrict to a limited function class because eta is constructed essentially separately for each x. Okay, so if you're fine with that, then I'd like to define the target function for you, which is also called the Bayes classifier. And that is um, denoted as t, and it's the sine of eta. So if I draw the target function, it looks like that, okay? So it's just the sine of eta. And that's basically what we're trying to get out of our function f. We're trying to construct f to look as closely as possible to the target function. Because remember, f just f predicts y from x. And the target function is the best we can possibly do if we had all of the modeling power in the world and if we had the whole distribution of data at our disposal. Okay, so there's the target function. And um, again, as I mentioned, the target function is the best you can possibly do. So it's actually the minimizer of the true risk. So if you know the whole distribution of data and you can choose any function you want, um, you would choose the target function to minimize the true risk. And the value of the true risk at the target function is called f star, or sorry, r star. r star is the best you can, the best um, true risk you can possibly get. It's also called the Bayes risk. Okay, the, it's the best risk, the Bayes risk. Okay, so back to reality. This is the empirical risk. The empirical risk is the fraction of the time on our data set that f doesn't equal y. Now, usually we would choose a function fn, okay? So n, n indicates, that notation indicates you get it from n data points, okay? So usually you would choose fn to minimize some regularized empirical risk, um, where here you've made a couple of choices, right? You, you had to choose the regularization, and then you had to choose the function class that you're working in. And both of these are modeling choices. I'm not gonna worry about the regularization term for for this, uh, for the re remainder of this lecture, I'm really going to just worry about that choice of um, that choice of class, which is that uh, big F. Okay. All right. So you have F n, which is what you can produce. You have T, which is what you want, and then there's something in between, and that something in between is F star. So F star is the um, the minimizer of the true risk within the class big F. Okay, so it's borrowing from both the it's borrowing both from t because it's using the true risk, so it assumes you know the whole distribution of data, but it's also borrowing from the empirical stuff because you're limiting yourself to this function class. Okay, so um, so yeah, so you have these three quantities here. So you have f, uh, fn, f sorry, you have fn, you have f star, and you have t. So I want you to think about T as being the best in theory, right? That's the best you can do if you have everything. You have an, you have, uh, an infinite capacity function class and you have the whole distribution of the data. And then you have the best in practice, which is Fn. And then in the middle, you have the best in class, which is F star. Okay, so um, there's a kind of classical diagram that goes with this way of thinking that I'm gonna put up for you right here. So the class uh, big F, that's that purple circle there, and each point in that circle represents a function, okay? And then, of course, the target is not inside that class. The target can be whatever it wants to be. It can be a super complicated function that's, again, it could be different, for, you know, even for points that are right next to each other, the target function can be completely different, right? Okay, so the target function is never assumed to be in the class F uh, in statistical learning theory. Now, um, you have fn, which is the one you got from your data. That's, of course, in the function class. And then you have f star, which is going to be the closest possible thing you can get to t 
but stay in the function class. Because again, F star knows the whole distribution of data. So there's no randomness in F star, no randomness in T. The only randomness is in the construction of Fn. All right, so um, I want you to think about uh, the uh, estimation error is sort of a sort of arising from the randomness in the data itself. Whereas the approximation error, I want you to think about it coming from a limitation on that function class. And so if you think, if you, if you think about it, if you grow the function class f, then you reduce the approximation error, but then you'd start overfitting. So your estimation error would, would get really big. So there's kind of a tug of war between these two quantities, right? If you make f, if you make that class bigger, then your approximation error gets smaller, but then yeah, your empirical error gets bad. Okay, so in any case, I, I want you to understand that, that that's some trade-off that you're, that you're making. Okay, so if we think about it, the, the, the thing that we really want is that the test error of Fn, we want that to be close to our star, which is the test error of T. All right, so I'm just gonna break that down a little bit and put it in terms of notation. So I want the true risk of Fn to be as close as possible to R star, which is the best possible true risk you can, you can ever get. Okay, so I've, I've, right there, I've just added zero in disguise, it's special zero in disguise, which comes from the best in class, okay? So I'm gonna look at these two terms, which is the, the true risk of the best in class minus our star. And then I'm also gonna look at the true risk of our empirical Fn minus the true risk of the best in class. So you see I'm sort of hopping from Fn to F star and then from F star to T. Okay, so these two quantities, these are the approximation error and the estimation error, and that's the way that they're officially defined. And now hopefully you understand what that diagram was kind of getting at. Okay. Now, you can't know anything about the approximation error from looking at the data, right? There's F star is not random, T is not random, the, the big F is not random. So there's nothing the data can tell us about the approximation error. And so um, in statistical learning theory, we have this thing about, you know, we don't like to make approximation, we don't like to make assumptions about the ground truth so T is kind of like out of bounds, like we're not actually allowed to sort of say anything about it. Um, if you're doing approximation theory, then you're allowed to say stuff about T, but in statistical learning theory, we don't get to say anything about T. So we usually don't touch the approximation error at all. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so the approximation error is generally off limits because you'd have to make some assumption about T and we're unwilling to do that. So we're gonna focus on the estimation error for the rest of the lecture. And you won't see the you won't see the approximation error or t or r star again in the remaining uh, in the remainder of the lecture, but you will see a whole lot of f star. <laughs> okay, so let's try to bound the true risk of f n. And again, you you can't calculate r true ever, right? You can never calculate that because you don't have the whole distribution of the data. Okay, so I'm going to write this as, um, again, I've added a, a lovely um, zero in disguise here, which is the empirical risk there. And then um, what I'm going to do is take this term, right? I, I really want to know how bad this term is, right? Because the only thing I can measure is the empirical risk of Fn. I can't measure the other, I can't measure the other terms, right? So I want an upper bound for it, and I want that upper bound to be as low as possible. So I'm calling it stuff right now, but that stuff is gonna get, it's gonna get more and more interesting as the lecture goes on. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we, we want an upper bound for it, so we're gonna create one. In fact, we're gonna create a whole bunch of them. Okay, so what comes next is a bound for a single function. And then a reason why that bound is no good. Then we're gonna give uh, we're going to give you the Occam's razor bound, which I think is probably one of the most beautiful bounds in all of machine learning, if not the most beautiful. And luckily, it's only a three-line proof. And then finally, we'll get to the VC bound. I hope you enjoy it.